Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for an MP webinar on the great resignation and best practices to retain your workforce. I'm Amy Weeman, head of marketing here at MP. And for those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, MP is a full service human capital management company offering a complete suite of products and services to support employers through the entire employee life cycle, including recruiting, HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions, as well as proactive, reliable service and deep HR and payroll expertise. At MP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I'm excited to introduce your presenter for today, Amanda Bridge. Amanda is an HR generalist here at MP. She currently provides HR support to small, medium, and large-sized businesses in a variety of industries, and was previously an HR generalist for a 200-plus employee pediatric nonprofit organization. And just a few housekeeping um, items, if you would like to submit a question during the program, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar later in the day with, um, along with the slides and any other resources. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic off to Amanda. Thank you, Amy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's presentation. Let's get started with our legal disclaimer. So this training is intended for educational and informational purposes. While we hope that you will learn a lot today, we are not attorneys and the information should not be construed as legal advice. Although you all already know what the great resignation is, we are going to look at what's going on, the cost of turnover, how to work towards reducing turnover, some ways to attract and retain your current staff, and some recruiting tips. I am sure you are all fully feeling the impact in your own workplaces, but also in the communities that you live, you shop, and you visit. I know I am always shocked to find out that the Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts that I just drove to has closed due to staffing issues. Some statistics to get us started. The BLS or the Bureau of Labor Statistics noted that as of Friday, November 12th, there were 10.4 million job openings and 4.4 million employees have quit. As for current employees, 41% are considering leaving their jobs. This is according to a Microsoft survey of over 30,000 workers in 31 countries. So this is a revolving cycle. Employees leave their job, but the work still has to be done. So other employees are asked to pick up the slack and fill those available shifts. Then they become overworked and are at risk for quitting. Prior to the pandemic, workers were becoming more confident, though, in demanding more from their employees and their employers, such as better compensation, uh, better working environments, and better benefits. If the pandemic were to end tomorrow, this is still going to be a problem. So it is reported that employees are leaving their jobs due to burnout. Being made to work more due to coworkers leaving or even an increase in volume due to the pandemic. Undefined hours, working at home has its benefits, but as you know, sometimes it's hard to know when to turn off. Also, some employees need to pick up extra shifts due to staffing. Higher wages due to the cost of living and increase in the price of products and services. Working conditions, some employees do not have the opportunity to work remotely or telecommute. And maybe their working conditions are something that they feel are toxic or their frustration, frustrated with the organization. Or some people who are required to go back to the office are looking for a remote position in order to obtain that work-life balance. Another reason is job dissatisfaction. People are just wondering, is this what I want to do anymore? A lot of hospitality, retail, and restaurant employees have a lack of security in their jobs and they are variable hours and often without a lot of benefits. Then we also have the health and safety concerns. So some jobs don't allow for adequate socially, social distancing. And not only does that put the employee at risk, but you know they could be afraid that they could bring that home to their families too. All right, so next we're gonna take a look at the cost of turnover along with some things to look out for. The first step in reducing turnover is realizing the cost of turnover. 
and why it's so important to retain your current employees and the costs associated with replacing them. Some of the hard costs are going to be separation costs, which would be any paid time off that needs to be paid out, and your unemployment rate could be impacted as well. Vacancy costs would include any current employees that would need to work extra due to the lack of staffing, and it could result in overtime. And you might also have to hire some temporary staff to fill those roles. Replacement costs are really going to be the vendor costs for background checks, drug testing, orientation, on-the-job training, where you're not only paying the employee, but you're also paying the trainer. And then there are soft costs, which are separation costs lost. So um, loss of productivity due to having a vacant position. You know, are you not able to provide all the services that you once used to because you have open shifts? Loss of productivity of coworkers. So when their time is now spent mentoring and supporting new hires. Loss of productivity of a supervisor. This could be due to additional coaching or oversight needed for the new hire. So here are some things to take a look out for. So um, with your current staff, this may cause them to that may cause them to leave. It is important to take notice and get a pulse from the employees. Having good relationships with the employees can help them open up to the struggles and the concerns that they have. A large amount of turnover in a specific department. This is something that you will want to examine and figure out the cause of the turnover and fix it before more employees leave. Any kind of life changes, meaning um, the employee may be expecting, or, you know, expanding their education. Um, they're, they're going to go back, going back to school or they're starting a new family. And these are some factors that may drive turnover. Lost job advancement opportunities. So do you have any employees who have recently been turned down for a promotion? This could leave them seeking employment elsewhere. And also lastly, absenteeism. Have any of you had an employee leave during the middle of the day? Do you sometimes question if they're leaving for an interview? This could be a telltale sign. Another thing to keep an eye on is an employee who may be less productive. They could be spending their working time looking for another position. So there's a quote by Peter Van Sollen that says, great employees are hard to find until you become a great employer and they find you. If you are able to retain talent, you are able to attract it. So let that sink in. If you can retain it, you can attract it. We have been recently hiring for HR partners on our team and we all participate in the interviewing process. When a candidate asks how our manager is to work for, if we were all to sit in silence, that would give a clear impression. However, the genuineness of how we all feel supported shows through. The same will apply to your current staff when they speak about the company or take part in the interview. So what do employees really want? They want, um, they want to work, work with us, um, work with the employee, not only explain how to do the tasks, but they want them to get their hands dirty. They are looking for a manager who is hands-on and shows up to support the team, not just sits back and expects everyone to do everything for them. A manager who is approachable, someone who has their backs. When um, someone who has a calm demeanor and someone who that they can go to with any problem that they might have. They're also looking for someone who truly cares, a manager who takes interest, who helps manage their goals and checks in with them. And lastly, someone who's accountable. Employers are looking for a manager to give feedback and ask a manager and ask as a manager what they can do better or how they can help. Also someone who expects more from them and pushes them to expand in their growth and development. So we're gonna take a look at some incentives that might be beneficial for you to examine closer. So given the loss of employees, companies are looking at how they can implement new incentives to help retain their staff. While I realize some companies may not be able to increase some financial benefits such as PTO, it is important to look to see if you are competitive for your industry. You also wanna be equitable. Have a plan as to how you could run into different pay equity situations. So, you know, you wanna be consistent and you wanna implement that across departments um, so that you're not offering one employee more paid time off at higher versus another, which could be a pay equity situation. 
Some companies are exploring sign-on bonuses to help attract candidates. Again, be sure to be equitable in this approach too. It could pose a disparate impact. There are other ways to attract talent too. Um, I'm a big supporter of having an employee referral bonus program. I feel this is a great way to attract good talent and also reward your current employees. With this program, you're able to determine the amount you wish to offer and break it up into segments. So for example, if you have an employee who refers another employee and they are hired, you could offer $50 after the first month of employment, then even $100 after three months of employment. You're able to offer higher monetary incentives for higher positions as well, or those harder to fill positions. So it, it, on, it not only offers the opportunity for the employee to make some money, but it's also bringing in employees that are of like mind and work ethics. And then maybe a one-time bonus to recognize current employees who have picked up extra shifts. You know, a small thank you could go a long way. So look at your current benefits offering. You wanna make sure it's competitive. Think about exploring an HRA to offset some of the costs of the deductibles. Another thing to consider is, do your current benefits still fit your employees? Have you hired a lot of out-of-state employees? If so, you should take a look at whether your current provider or carrier provides adequate coverage for your new remote hires. For example, MassPay, pre-pandemic, we were all pretty much located close to our Beverly office where we were headquartered. And now we have employees in 17 different states. So taking a look at the benefit offering and make sure that it is able to help out all those other people in the different states and it covers them is definitely important. Also, explore what your current health insurance offers. Are there any fun incentive programs? Make sure you communicate this with these employees as it is an added benefit. Last year, we were able to get free New Balance sneakers and this year a free Peloton membership. So those all add into your company's overall benefits. So make sure you monopolize on those. Look into offering an EAP. People are all going through different sorts of stresses. We have all been navigating the same storm, but in different boats. In other words, the way the pandemic affects us is different for each individual situation. So having an EAP could help support your staff. FSA dependent care. This could assist employees who are struggling due to childcare costs. You also wanna make sure that your benefits remain competitive. This is a tall order and may squeeze your bottom line in ways that make you uncomfortable, but it is necessary if, you, if retention is one of the top priorities on your list. You wanna do a yearly analysis to make sure that you're keeping up with the market. If you don't know what kind of benefits your employees are looking for, survey them and ask. See what would be beneficial to add to the company benefits. See what you know, your demographics and employees place the most precedent on. So I do understand that some companies have limitations as to what they are able to offer, but try to look at the employee as a whole their family, their educational goals, et cetera, and see if there is anywhere in your business that you can accommodate any of the following. Remote work or a hybrid? Well, I know some companies are anxious to get employees back to the office. Employers have found that they can be more productive and not spend as much time commuting. If this isn't an option to offer as a full-time benefit, consider a hybrid role where employees could work from home on alternating, alternating days. Autonomy and flexible hours. For remote or non-remote positions, focus on the output of deliverables rather than the hours logged. Life is busy, things happen to all of us. The ability to have flexible hours, if the position warrants, is valuable to employees. They may not take a higher paying job because of the flexibility of their position offers. So some employees may have childcare needs um, and it might not be doable to look at alternative schedule, but see if you can help them meet, meet those needs. Having a flexible schedule can be a cost-effective way to increase employee retention. Practice what you preach. Um, encourage time off. Be a role model and set an example of that time off is important. If you have a manager that never takes time off, you are going to feel obligated to work rather than use your earned time off. Make sure that you're encouraging that work-life balance. This means not <clears throat> expecting someone to reply to your email at nine o'clock at night. 
I know some of us, you know, don't finish up the day or have that last minute thought where you send an email out at nine o'clock at night just so that you don't forget. But if your employees are seeing that, you know, there's a possibility that they might think that you want them to respond after hours. Um, there is a way to schedule emails that you write after hours to be sent out the next morning, which is pretty cool. Although employees may not be expected to reply, they may feel pressured to do so if the manager is still working. So remember that and practice what you preach. That way your employees don't think that you expect them to reply if they are just getting their emails early the next morning when they come into work. When you focus on being the best place to work in your industry, top talent will be on your team. Don't just make a product or deliver a service. Focus on fair pay, advancement opportunities, a caring culture, professional development, high standards, and an opportunity to make a meaningful contribution. This will make your company great and help you attract great people. So to talk about some of the workplace culture things, um, employee satisfaction, I'm sure many of you have seen what a snowball effect kind of looks like or does to a company when an employee is, is you know, dissatisfied, they talk, they tell other employees, um, it could become toxic. Invest in your employees, listen to what they have to say. Give back to the community. Having a company mission and values is important. So if you don't have one, look into developing one. Employees are now placing a lot of value on how their company supports the community. Consider on offering a paid day off to do community service individually for a cause that they're passionate about or a team get together to do community service activity. Understand how they play a role in the success of the company. Then we also have technology. How are your employees connecting with each other if they work in a virtual environment? Are there remote positions? Look at your technology and see if there's a way to enhance communication. We have all benefited from using Microsoft Teams as it's been a piece that has helped us stay connected throughout the whole pandemic. Recognition. So recognize your high performers. Show appreciation to the employees that go the extra mile. Little appreciation can go a long way. Transparency. Be transparent about how the company is doing. At the beginning of the pandemic, if any company was experiencing layoffs, employees may have felt that their job was in jeopardy. If your business isn't doing as well as it had been, let the employees know how you, did, you intend on keeping it afloat. Job security is a concern of many these days, so be transparent. So this is one of my favorite parts of it. So survey employees. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the interviews, maybe you all have, but conducting an anonymous survey can really help provide some helpful insight into how your current employees feel. I'll stop. About how they feel and what information you could use to see how you could do better. Take the positive information you gather and incorporate it into your job postings. The information you gather, consider grouping employees together across departments for strategic goals on things that you could improve on. This will not only get the employees buy-in for the solution, but also foster some cross-collaboration between departments. Employers should only conduct stay interviews if you're able to take action. Not every grievance can be met with a solution, but it is important to effectively communicate any barriers in making these specific changes. When communicating, share how the company can work towards a solution. It doesn't necessarily need to be instantaneously. Okay, so your employee value proposition is the message you will use to target your prospective candidates. The graphic explains that EVP is really an all-encompassing all as to the value of your company brings to its employees. So factors such as compensation, benefits, career, work environment, culture are all important to look at. When you are targeting passive candidates, it's important to remember that the option to potentially work for your company is a choice for that candidate and not a necessity. 
the passive candidate will already have the stability and likely the compensation. This is where you really need to think about what you can offer that is different. Not only can EVP or the employee value proposition be used as a magnet for attracting new hires, it can also help engage and retain current employees. So ask yourself these questions to see if you have the answers. Why do your current employees choose to work here? Why do they stay? What do most of them like about you as an employer? These are some questions that you need to or answer in order to set up a successful strategy. By answering these questions, you will be able to best explain your employee value proposition. This will then help differentiate what separates you from your competition and what values you bring to the employees that other employers don't. So here are some tips. Um, train your managers, observe them in practice. If you have a manager who is demoralizing, train them to be effective managers, follow up on their progress, prevent them from poisoning the well. If you are an HR services client, make sure to take advantage of some of our soft skills trainings that we offer. Prioritize engaging employees and making them feel valued and heard. In a lot of companies, the priority is the bottom line and making money. Consider employee engagement as one of your best investments in your company's success. An engaged employee will help you expand your bottom line. MP places a lot of value on its employee engagement and in turn, we have grown exponentially. Develop strong and transparent promotion tracks. Show the employees what they need to accomplish to move up in the company. Follow up with them and assist them in their growth and development. Be transparent about the company, where it's headed, and explain how everyone plays a role in the success. Let's get into some, some tips for recruiting. I don't know. Um, although these are some creative job titles, they may be poorly understood and not have as many responses to the posting. On a side note, you wanna make sure that your position titles are not gender biased too. So although these are very creative, um, I don't think that they're gonna be in the search engine when you're searching for a position. You also wanna review current postings to make sure it's a job ad and not a job description. This is something that I see quite often when you look on job boards is basically just copying and pasting of the job description. So job ads are really about selling the position and using the information from the employee value proposition to describe why they should come work for you. Whereas a job description is meant to be an internal document. Make sure your job ads are candidate centric. Here's an example of a supportive language. As a core member of the project management team, you'll be expected to work autonomously and deliver on project phases on time and on budget. We will help you achieve your goals by continuous professional development at regular career progression sessions. So as you can see, the company-centric language says things such as the successful applicant. Take note of the specific language used in the supportive ad. Instead of calling the candidate the applicant, as demanding ad does, the supportive ad refers to the candidate as you. So it really puts the candidate front and center and also helps them envision themselves in that role. Some tips and tricks for this are search friendly content. So the job ad should be easily found on the search engines. Be brief, clear, and to the point. Use short paragraphs and bullet points. Clearly separate required and desirable skills. If you don't differentiate, job seekers may conclude that they are not sufficiently qualified for that role. So you really want to differentiate those two. Lead with what you offer and not what you need. Okay, so a tip. I want you to try to be the applicant of a position that you have open in your company. Think back to when you were hired. <clears throat> what worked well and what was missing? Remember the first impression of the company starts with the interview process. Fill out the new hire work. Go ahead, take out the packet, fill out all the forms that need to be filled out in order to get hired and see if there's an easier way to do them. Can they be combined? Um, 
or even maybe made electronic if they're not already. Take a look at your company website. Does it reflect the company culture? This is a big one. So make sure, as we talked about, that your job ad is showing the applicant why they should work for you in using language that helps them envision themselves in the role. Behavioral interviewing questions. So you wanna ask the applicant questions that provide an opportunity for them to elaborate on a situation rather than a question that only requires a yes or no answer. Also ask the same questions of each applicant for positions to avoid any kind of disparate impact. Put some thought into the hiring and onboarding experience. Remember onboarding is an ongoing thing and it isn't really just about employee training. You wanna check back and check in with them periodically and often. The candidate experience is your report card from past candidates and prospective talent on how well they were treated and communicated with along the hiring process. So now that we're in a world where we use social media, this report card is posted all over the internet for the world to see. And you want the world to see positivity. What is the first thing that people see or do when they go to apply for the job? They look at the reviews. So you take a look at the company website, you take a look at Glassdoor or any of those other review sites, and even the Google ads. The last thing that you want them to see are negative comments on those forums. This is why it is so important to take responsibility to ensure every candidate experience is a good one. So where can you recruit top talent? LinkedIn is the premier professional network site online and a great place to find potential candidates. Professionals and students use LinkedIn to create awareness about themselves and what they do. Employers can search LinkedIn too to find out you know, what candidates might fit their needs and review those resumes. You can also create a company profile that people can follow and connect with your employees on that platform. And you can also post job openings on that site as well. <clears throat> social media. So how's your social media following on either Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, even YouTube? The people who follow your company do so for a reason. So share job openings with a social media audience and you know, potentially get some job seekers who already like you or could refer you to someone else. There are also college alumni and career websites. So most US colleges and universities offer or operate career centers designed to help students and alumni find employment. Often you can find job postings on their websites for free and enables you to find quality job candidates, but it also helps the school recruit potential students as well. So explore your local colleges and alumni and career centers around you. Establishing an ongoing relationship with area schools can lead to referrals when they have students who are an ideal candidate for your company. So communicate what your needs are effectively. There are also professional organizations. So as you know, some HR professionals on this, you know, I'm sure you've heard of SHRM or some other um, local chapters that are to you, you know, make sure that you're, you're putting your jobs out there and spreading the word and networking. Then there are also networking events. When you attend a networking event, you wanna spread the word about your company too. The person that you next meet could just be your next new hire. So I'm gonna open it up to some Q and A's and if you have any questions, we'll be happy to kind of talk through them and answer them for you. Okay. Um, I have one question that says, should I do state interviews if my employees seem upset or ready to leave? Yes. Um, I think it's a great idea to get a pulse on your current employees um, and hopefully save them from, you know, resigning or looking for other positions. When doing the state interviews, you really want to make sure that you're compiling, compiling the data and addressing all of their concerns. So, you know, if they want more money. And that's one of the things, you know, what can you do to support them? Not everyone can just get more money, but, um, you know, you can kind of look at other creative ways. So maybe, um, 
help that employee or, you know, create those clear career tracks that employees can kind of build on and you can help them with their goals, both pers personally and professionally. Um, so I definitely think stay interviews are, are a good thing to do just to get a pulse and see, you know, are you doing as well as you're doing? What are some of the suggestions that are happening? Okay. Um, next question. Should an employer always offer a counter offer? I think it depends. I think it depends on, um, the employee. And I think that if there's the opportunity for a counter offer, it already means that the employees sort of dis satisfied already with the position. Um, and that gives you a good telltale sign that you should probably get a pulse for your for your current employees. I don't think it's a bad idea to do a, a counter offer, but you know, it depends if is the employee a great employee? Is it going to be hard to refill this position? Um, that those sort of things and then really help build on that employee engagement so that you can retain that employee if they do accept your offer. The other thing is the cost of um, the cost of rehiring an employee is about one third of uh, whatever the position pays annual salary. So, you know, a third of their annual salary to replace that position. So that's really challenging. And that's really, you know, somewhere where you could kind of stop the bleeding and, and put that kind of money into your current employee base that will help them stay and you can help retain those talents too. Um, so Amanda, it does look like we're getting some questions as well um, in the yeah. Q&A on the bottom. Okay, great. I'm um, reading through some of them. Sorry, Amy, thanks. Okay, great. Okay, someone says, I have less than six part-time employees. It's a retail shop. What benefits would someone expect at 25 to 30 hours a week? I think that's a great question because I think a lot of times too, employees are, you know, they're working more than one job. So maybe they're working with you part-time and working somewhere else part-time. So they're really not getting those benefits. Um, what benefits I like that really don't cost the employer anything are going to be those supplemental benefits. Um, so that's really your AFLAC or, you know, other, other providers that provide those benefits. Now, it doesn't cost the employer anything. They can be withheld through the employee's paycheck and set up through your payroll provider. But what it kind of does is it seems like your benefit offering is a lot better. So, you know, if you're offering accident insurance or cancer insurance or different things like that, it increases your benefit offering and it's 100% employee funded. So they feel like they have the opportunity to get those benefits through you as an employer. And not a lot of people know that they can go get them on their own. If they were to get them on their own, um, they would have to write a, a check, you know, monthly directly to the, the supplemental insurance carrier. So this is kind of like an easy access way to increase your benefit offering, but not have a lot of costs associated with it. You could also consider, you know, contributing to some of those supplemental benefits yourself. So um, maybe you pay 25% of it to, you know, help retain your employees and show, you know, appreciation. And the, the amounts are really nominal too. So um, that's something to consider. Um, you could you could do, it, it depends on, is your organization really a high turnover organization where you'd be paying out a, a lot of paid time off, but you could consider doing paid time off at a part-time rate um, where it would be obviously less of an accrual rate, but still offering some time for the employee to you know accrue to take some time off if needed. So that was a really great question. Um, someone said, I'm really struggling with the typical ways of recruiting and attracting candidates. Any outside creative things that you've seen? Um, I definitely think it, you know, it's, it's not a solution that you can just put a Band-Aid on. It's really something that has to start with a solid foundation of your company. Um, you know, maybe even getting some reviews from your employees and talking to them if you have a pretty satisfied employee base, you know, talk to them and find out what they like best about um, working for you and monopolize on that, you know, share those quotes, share those things on social media, um, you know, posting on all those outside job boards are really going to be helpful too, and contacting those career centers to see if they do have anyone that is looking. Um, it really depends, is it a, you know, an entry level position or a high position, but, you know, creating those, you um, employee referral bonuses too. So 
you know, talk to your employees about what you're looking for. Tell them, you know, the ideal candidate and, you know, encourage them to talk to their friends, to their families. Um, you know, if they're out having a conversation to promote your company, it's really going to be the best way. Um, let's see. Can I just focus on making sure that my star players are happy or do I have to do this for all employees? So that's a good question. Um, obviously you wanna make sure that your star players are happy, but doing this with all of your employees is gonna really prove to be beneficial um, because you wanna work on their, their growth and development too to make them those star players. You know, what, what qualities do your star players possess that you want everyone on your staff to embody too? So, you know, making sure your employees as a whole are all happy and, you know, what, what you can do to improve on is really great. And, you know, we've done these anonymous surveys for clients and we get some really great participation and results. And then, you know, taking the time during a company meeting to share those results, obviously anonymously, but, you know, what does the majority of people want? What are they looking for? And then how are you going to improve on that as a company? I think it just takes a little bit of effort from the employer side to show that they want to make changes and that the employees are heard to help retaining those positions. If they feel like change is happening or if it's being worked on, I feel like employees are more apt to stay in their current roles. Um, let's see. All right, I do have some more. Just. Um, this is a good one. What benefits do you suggest offering remote providers or staff? So as a remote position right now, I can tell you that some of the struggles that I have are, you know, my commute is very short. It's within my same house. Um, and sometimes you get lost in the monotony of that. Um, when we did used to commute to the office, it was really nice to have that, you know, half an hour drive where you could kind of decompress on the way there, on the way home stop and get a coffee, those sort of things. So I think it's important to still recognize that, you know, remote employees are very much, even though there's sometimes a work-life balance, they're still prone to burnout and, you know, in really encouraging um, that they take time or that they have those conversations with coworkers that they didn't get to, have, that they won't get to have because they're working remotely. Um, you know, they're not going to bump into them in the hall, they're not going to run into them and be able to talk about their weekend. So having breaks like that, I think would be really good. So whether you schedule them with your current staff, um, with each other or other departments, maybe, I mean, I know we tried out like coffee time. So, you know, 10 minutes, not a lot out of the day, but you schedule it with other employees um, so that they can communicate with each other and kind of check in and, and just have some social time too, because it can start to feel pretty siloed. Um, someone else asked, what are some of the things you can do if you suspect one employee is causing a toxic environment? I think it's really important to pay attention to that as soon as you're made aware of that situation, because honestly, it is going to poison that well. Um, and it depends on what kind of toxic environment. I think it would be a good idea to sit down with the employee, you know, given the situation, I would definitely want to have more details on it to help coach you, but to have a, you know, a conversation as to what's going on, what is making them so unhappy. Um, or, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, even considering doing one of those stay interviews and rolling that out for your environment and, you know, hoping that they'll, they'll answer honestly about what's going on, or maybe it's that they missed out on a promotion or, you know, they don't feel like they're being valued in their role. So pay attention to those little personal signs of theirs. You know, what are they saying? What is it from? What's it in relation to? Um, you know, is it a bad working environment with their manager? You know, how can you help that? How can you help them get along better? How can you, you know, have trainings that they can attend to work better together or, you know, kind of foster that positive work environment and really put a lot of precedent on that? Uh, let's see. Um, someone asked what sign-on bonus structures do I like for professional staff positions? 
Um, I really like some sign-on bonus structures that also incorporate that retention bonus as well. So you're kind of getting more bang for your buck there. So an initial um, bonus offering followed by, you know, a three month or a six month review and, you know, the rest of the bonus at that. I really think there's a great way to structure that and, um, you know, kind of have the metrics to make sure that you spell out the metrics of that position and where you want to see them at in three or six months. Are they hitting their goals um, and things like that? I'm, I'm happy to talk offline about structuring a bonus program um, for sign-ons also for more specific, you know, for that specific position. Um, Okay, I've noticed a little higher turnover in our remote colleagues. Any other recommendations to promote the inclusive inclusion and connection? So it is really hard. And, you know, I, I don't know the answers to that, but I think asking them what they're looking for. I mean, really having that open communication rather than coming up with your own ideas of some things that might help, um, find out where their pain points are. Are they overworked? Are they unable to shut off at the end of the day um, because they have other things to do or, you know, they're too busy to um, take a break, you know, really find out what, what's going on there and address those specific pain points. Um, and you can really do so by asking some pretty vague questions and asking them to eliminate, um, to elaborate on them. So it could be, you know, what do you like most and what do you like least? It could be what what skills aren't we using of yours? Um, what suggestions do you have that could make the, you know, the remote work a little bit more um, interactive? You know, what, what can you do differently there to really help that? But I really think talking to the employees first and having those dialogues um, are really going to get you some <clears throat> pretty valuable information. And you can use that information to really help build that strong culture, which is really the foundation of it all. Oh, okay, so someone said um, for the previous question prior to the, the last one, I meant more actual benefits for remote staff. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I'm not sure if you're talking about like maybe, you know, the work environments or benefits for remote staff. I don't know that they'd be really any different than your actual work, your in office staff. Um, you know, they're going to have the same healthcare benefits and stuff like that that would be offered to them. But, you know, if you want to explain more, I'm happy to work that one out with you. Um, let's see, we had some of that. Yeah, we have some great questions. Um, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm trying to take a second to read through them all. Um, someone asked if I have a good framework for onboarding. Um, absolutely. Um, I can talk to it for a second, but then I can also share that with you. So for onboarding, um, I think it's it's not all about training. And I think a lot of the onboardings are going to be heavily weighed down with a lot of trainings and meetings and can be really draining. I think that, you know, spacing it out, really getting them to know the culture, the organization, the people are really going to be beneficial when they're working together in teams um, so that they get to know their coworkers so that they have that time. And also, you know, that it just doesn't end. I think a lot of people think that onboarding ends after two weeks, um, which is, it's, it's really not the case. Um, you really should be checking in on an ongoing basis and setting up those meetings. And, you know, because as things progress and they get to learn the role more, they're also going to have questions about things that you may not have think, thought about. Um, for instance, I remember when I started at MassPay, there were probably five or six different printers and none of them made sense as to which printer to print to. And it was just one of those inconveniences, but just to have someone to ask, someone to have as a mentor um, so that you can really set that up. And, you know, there's a lot to it too. Some people might be better at technology than others. So making sure that they're supported in the technology when they're coming on board that you use that they may not be familiar with. Um, I really think that it, it's a it's an ongoing thing that could, should probably last up to a year after the employee is hired, um, and that doesn't mean that it's going to be heavy on training. It just means that you're doing that communication and those check-ins with those employees that are hired, and 
just making sure that they don't have any questions and giving them an opportunity to ask those questions should they come about. So let's see. You all have some really great questions, this is great. Okay, I like this one. Um, this year, inflation is so high, so employees are complaining about their lower increment, probably wages. So how do we handle this situation? Um, I think that's gonna go back to transparency. Um, I think everyone has an understanding that this has been a really hard year to two years for not only employees, but employers and their bottom line. And not only is that always, you know, everyone will always, no matter what they're being paid, you ask anyone, you know, what they want most from their company, they're going to say more money. But I think it's really about building that employee engagement and offering things in another way. So, you know, there had been times where there are nonprofits that, you know, they're not able to pay that high dollar, but they offer more paid time off in turn. So um, I think that's really where you start to get creative, where the money isn't necessarily there, but outlining what you do offer is going to be really important. So, you know, you offer health insurance, but did you know about the added benefit of X, Y, and Z, you know, this program or this program and communicating it with their, the employees? Because I think, you know, what happens is open enrollment comes, you know, by once a year and they get all these packets and then, okay, they move on. They have insurance coverage. But to really help explain what that all means and how they can benefit from that, I think it's going to be really helpful having them understand, you know, what they're entitled to, what their costs are, you know, how to sign up for delivery of prescriptions, those kind of things are really going to help build that strong structure, I think, with um, your culture too. And, you know, maybe even more transparency in how the company is doing, how you're working on getting the company back to where it should be and what that will mean and the growth and how there will be, you know, opportunity for advancement because of that. So, um, where people aren't really not able to, to have those higher pay increases, I think it's important to kind of have that open transparency, that discussion, and a full understanding of what the benefits are that you do offer, and maybe what they're looking for. Is it, you know, those, those pay time off things? Are you able to let people go early on a Friday and pay them for the rest of the day, um, encourage time off, that kind of thing? Oh, this is, this is a good one. Okay. So we offer the same benefits for remote, but um, I think we need to encourage more employee connections. So volunteering, social events, and virtual happy hours, um, how to protect and separate home versus work time when the office is at home. That is huge. So um, yeah, walking one-on-ones versus sitting in Zoom or Teams. Um, do some kind of um, cool training, get an outside speaker in to talk about you know, the work-life balance, some tips and tricks to stay healthy, to make sure that, you know, you set an alarm every, I don't know, two hours and you get outside if the weather's nice or you do something for yourself or, you know, things like that. But yeah, to really encourage those employee connections through remote, remote are really hard. Um, and I found that working, you know, where you're not able to have necessarily sometimes the face-to-face -face with clients, um, it's harder to build those connections. So, you really want to, you know, find out what, what your employee base are, are really passionate about. And I think, you know, virtual happy hours is great if you're able to do that. Absolutely. You know, break it into teams, um, play some games, switch up the rooms. Um, we had a really great speaker come in and we did kind of like a fun game to get to know each other better because, you know, as we're adding more and more remote team members, we're also not being able to, we're not getting able, we're not being able to get to know them better. So, you know, it, it gets you to stop for a second, pay attention to what's going on, um, you know, talk about them, their story, how they got there, their history. And you establishing those employee connections is really going to be helpful. And, you know, in the work environment too, you're more apt to pick up the phone for someone that you have a relationship with and ask for help than, you know, someone you've never met. So I think that's going to be really important. 
everyone had some really great questions. Um, some of these I will be happy to take offline and follow up with you, um, but I will pass it back over to Amy. Thank you, Amanda. So any of the questions that we were not able to answer on today's program will receive a response via email within two to three business days. And if you are experiencing turnover in your organization and having difficulty filling positions, MP has a full service recruiting team. Uh, we also have a full team of HR specialists that can assist you with any HR and compliance issues you may be having. Um, and you can learn more about all of these services on our website at mp-hr.com under the solutions tab. Please join us next week at the same time um, for an informative webinar on COVID vaccination mandates and best practices for communication in the workplace. You can visit our website to register, see the full calendar of events and all of our eBooks and other resources that we have. And just a last reminder that we'll be sending out a recording of today's program along with the slides later today. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Amanda, for that great content and have a terrific day, everyone.